on Wikipedia, there's a great page called The List of Common Misconceptions. It contains things like the fact that the Book of Genesis never identifies the forbidden fruit as an apple, or that cement shoes haven't commonly been used by the Mafia or any other organised criminal gangs. No, they're almost exclusively used for people who are rude to the team in our comment section. But during our enforced corona break, we got rather a lot of, well, shall I say, interesting comments on our videos. I'd say there were questions, but they weren't because the authors didn't seem interested in the answers. And while the folks just asking didn't seem to respond well to actual responses to their questions, there are plenty of folks out there who are genuinely interested and have those self same misconceptions. So while we'll point shouty bobs to this video, this is really for all of you who are wondering, well, here it is, the Transport Evolved list of common EV misconceptions. Right, over to the comment section. Okay, that's a lot of words. That's a lot of words. Huh. Okay, so instead, let's take a look at the questions that seem to be at the heart of the tons of questions that we got. Everybody knows that EVs take hours to charge and only go 50 miles. Okay, so one of the top misconceptions is that you can only go a very short distance between very long charging stops. And that is actually true if you're driving a 2010 Mitsubishi iMeve. That wee beastie could go all of about 60 miles and took about half an hour to recharge at a DC rapid charger, assuming in the US that you had the DC rapid charging option. But assuming you're driving something produced in the last few years, then no, it's not true. Unless you picked up a cheap Mazda MX-30, in which case my condolences. These days the average range of an EV sold in the US is around 300 miles. Now. Typically, if you're road tripping, you'll use about 70% of that because in most EVs, it's quickest to charge from around 10% up to 80% full. I'm not going to explain why right now, but if you're interested, we can make a more up-to-date video explaining that because our last one on that topic is a few years old and some of the information is a little out of date. Drop a note in the comments if you dare, but if you do, you'll need to do a con saving throw and I'll need you to roll for initiative, please. Okay, so let's say you hop into your fully charged car at home and leave on your road trip. You've got about 270 miles, that is down to about 10% before your first stop. At a steady 70, that's a solid four hours of driving. Then you've got somewhere between 15 minutes and half an hour in a typical modern EV before you can head on with it refilled to about 80%. From that point on, because you'll only be filling back up to at most 80%, it will probably be around three hours between stops. Again, those stops are usually about the length of time it takes to pee and grab a drink. So yes, it might take a little longer than driving in a gas car, but in a modern EV it probably won't be all that noticeable unless you're in an area with sparse charging stations that limit your charging options, or are one of those charming folks who regularly pees in a bottle while driving. Uh, Kate? Hmm? Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but most motoring organisations, um, they recommend you don't travel more than about two or three hours before taking a break and then then it's a 15 minute break preferably 30 and uh it says here that you really should take longer breaks every three hours or so so there's really not much difference in you taking a gas car versus an ev oh and while i'm on the subject even if you have one of those fancy evs that you know drives itself or can go like a gazillion miles you, pro you probably want to rest as well. So it's all about making sure you don't, you know, well. Everybody knows that EVs can't be charged in the wet or cold, or when it's really sunny or hot. This is a quickie. You can. Charging systems are carefully designed to make charging in inclement weather safe. The charging system won't turn on until it's had a nice chat with the car and there are a wide variety of checks made before the power is connected. And while cars with limited thermal management are still on the used and even on the new market, 
That'd be the Nissan Leaf and older cars like the Volkswagen e-Golf, the pre-2020 Kia Soul EV, and the Mitsubishi iMe. Pretty much everything else has better thermal management, meaning that charging, whether it's hot or cold, won't be an issue. Those cars with less effective thermal management are probably best relegated to temperate areas where they're not doing a ton of long distance trips, which require a lot of rapid charging. It takes so much more energy to build an EV than a gas car. You'll never make that carbon difference up. This hoary old chestnut comes back year after year. We've actually made an in-depth exploration of this off the back of the Volvo study that was grossly misreported in a lot of the media. There's a link up here and down there. The basic truth is that yes, EVs typically take a chunk more energy to make them, but that energy is quickly made up for by the fact that electric motors are nearly 100% efficient, and fossil fuel engines after a full 100 years of committed development have peaked at about 20-30% to 30 efficiency. And while the electrical grid continues to get cleaner using more and more renewables, fossil fuel production gets dirtier and dirtier as we try and extract harder to get to and lower and lower quality oil from more and more remote locations. Since the average lifespan of a vehicle sits around 12 years in the US and in Europe, it's really important to consider the period after manufacture as well as the energy expended making the thing. And that's where the magic happens. After an average of about 3 years or 30,000 miles, at least as things stood last year, an EV is cleaner than its gasoline counterpart. Because the amount of energy it's using to go anywhere is lower, and the energy it's using is generally cleaner, and keeps getting cleaner. Oh, and that crossover point where the EV is cleaner is getting shorter and shorter. In 2021, it stood at around 30,000 miles or 44,000 kilometers if you charge your car on clean energy, and about 50,000 miles or 77,000 kilometers on the European grid mix. Now, despite that piece of information being well and truly public, I can hear someone somewhere typing. Where do you think the electricity comes from, from driving an EV? It all comes from burning coal! <laughs> ah, so there is literally no part of the world in which this is true. That said, depending on where you are in the world, fossil fuels can make up anything from zero to about 90% of energy generation. But that said, in many places it's also possible to pay for exclusively renewable energy, something that we ourselves have done for many years. But all that said, this isn't the gotcha the typist thinks it is, because even when powered from mostly coal, the EV still eventually comes out cleaner. It just takes a few more miles. And so in the US, with the possible exception of folks in West Virginia, which is an extreme outlier, an EV will still work out cleaner. That's because after West Virginia, which is powered by 91% coal, Missouri and Wyoming, the next states in line, drop to around 70%. In comparison, in Europe, Estonia and Poland's solid fuel component is only around 50%, and they are far and away the most coal-dependent European nations. Hopping back to the US after Missouri and Wyoming, the percentage of coal generation state by state drops really rapidly down to about 50%, then 40, 20, and for many states less than 10. And as more and more renewables come on stream, and those renewables remain cheaper to install and run than Victorian fossil fueled power plants, it's going to become harder to get the cash to build fossil fuel power plants, and harder to get the loans to extend the lifespan of those that do exist, so it's highly likely that the grid mix will just continue to get cleaner. But that does bring us nicely to... The grid can't cope! Okay, okay, it's... Rue. If every single car on the planet was overnight switched to be an EV, I'm pretty sure there would be some grid issues. Probably some Vogon destructor fleet sized ones. We know what a Vogon grid issue would be like. Ten weeks of filing triplicate paperwork just to get a meeting about turning the power on. But I'm going to let you into a secret. That's not terribly likely to happen. As I pointed out earlier, modern cars, I'm talking internal combustion engine ones, have an average lifespan of around 12 years. Surprisingly short to my mind, but that means that for us to replace the entire current fleet with electric vehicles is gonna take a while. And that's because not only do we currently have an affordability problem with EVs, we also have an availability problem. Both of those seem to be gradually easing, but at the same time the transition is going to take some precious time. 
And during that time, the things scientists and engineers have been working on to make sure the grid will continue to function well, even with a high percentage of transportation being electrified, will certainly move from being pilot projects that we're seeing right now to the much larger deployments that we expect to see soon. So what are they? Well, first up, most people asking this don't realise that nearly all EV charging is done at relatively low power draws and at home, not on rapid chargers. That charging takes place most commonly at night. Despite some ranty commenters explaining otherwise, grid demand actually does drop substantially at night, so using this period to charge cars is handy and actually puts little extra strain on the grid. In fact, Smoothing out grid demand to be more consistent is generally positive, so long as it's predictable. Although there's some argument that we may need to shift that charging into the daytime to make use of the available solar and wind energy, and that might help with grid stability, but we have a whole video on that coming up. Secondly, those car chargers are increasingly getting kind of smart, and in many areas there are pilot projects where you can get a kickback or a discount or some other kind of benefit for allowing your utility to ask nicely for you to not charge or charge at a lower speed, because grid demand is high. All the examples I've seen have an override that you can hit, or a the car needs to be charged by this time function, so that you can get a top up when you need a top up. As these projects gather more data, we'll increasingly see that being the norm. But that's only one half of the solution, because EVs can actually stabilise the grid by balancing demand. Using only a tiny percentage of your battery capacity in a bi-directional charger, an EV left plugged in can supply some power back to the grid for short chunks of time, which can be used, if the power company so decides, to avoid turning on natural gas peaker plants. Plants that are typically used to boost the grid when there's a sudden spike in demand. Cars are a terribly inefficient means of transportation and resource use in part because they spend around 95% of their existence parked, doing nothing but attracting local rodents to the soy insulation buffet. But by using them as mobile battery storage during that parked during nothing period, we can actually help not hinder the grid. Oh, and if you're worried about battery life, we had a great in-depth interview with Honda who used their fleet of fit EVs for testing this technology. We've dropped a link in the description below, and up in the optimistic maybe it'll work clicky zone. And that brings us to our final common misconception, at least for this video. There aren't enough rare earth metals to make all the batteries, and they all come from terrible places of human rights abuses. This one is more of a toughie. While the actual quantity of metals isn't really an issue, rare earth is not really rare in terms of quantity overall, it's more the spread of it. Rather than occurring in big lumps like iron ore or seams of coal, these metals are sprinkled like a seasoning or the sprinkles on ice cream. The ice cream that's our planet that we're melting. Uh, anyway, that makes getting them a bit harder, and historically it's been messier and largely done in places with worse human rights records than even our own shabby attempts. But before we deal with that question, let's look at the default bias here, which is ignoring the fact that a lot of these self-same metals are used in oil refineries or in other petrochemical processes, or other rare earth metals are used to make catalytic converters for gasoline vehicles, and those metals don't always come from nice cuddly mines with happy clappy workers. A typical catalytic converter contains around 3 to 7 grams of platinum, 2 to 7 grams of palladium, 1 to 2 grams of rhodium. These metals are worth far more than gold, and are why people like to nick catalytic converters. And the best answer I found suggests that around 500 grams of cobalt, that's about a pound, goes into refining around 80,000 gallons of petrochemicals. That is recovered afterwards and reused, but then the same is true for cobalt in batteries, and many companies are working on cobalt-free battery chemistries. So first up, stop with the disingenuous hypocrisy. It's a bad look. But that said, we do need to fix this. That's done with better oversights of the mines, better tracking of where the minerals came from, more transparency about extraction. It's also done with less harmful extraction methods, like the ones being looked at by Cornish Lithium, which we included in our sustainability video, linked down there, and hopefully up there. It's done with reducing the need for these elements in the batteries through committed research into safer chemistries. 
These are all serious problems, and ripping apart our planet just so we can make Elon Musk another billion dollars isn't a good plan, but we also have to look at the fact that every new gasoline or diesel car on the road will likely be there in at least 10 years, and will be more polluting then than it is now. Which is the better choice? Well, from an environmental perspective, we need to push for EVs, but at the same time, we need to push for better resource extraction. We need a dramatic push for electrification and expansion of public transportation, along with encouraging people to work from home or from local shared spaces, rather than commuting massive distances. We need more livable, walkable cities, particularly in the US, where car-based infrastructure is king. Shifting all those things will mean we can make the world a cleaner, greener, safer and smarter place. And that can only be a good thing. Are there any misconceptions that you've encountered you want us to clear up? Drop them down there in the comments below. That's it for today. Thanks for joining me, and see you next time. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and sharing it with your friends. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do, and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this channel and our other channel, Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And be sure to check out our regular sponsors, including the lovely folks at Unspun and Energy Stage. Links are down in the description. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to everyone who makes TE possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch our videos and share them. If you're a supporter at the Charged Up level, you'll see your name right here on my right. And if you just joined us, we're sorry if your name isn't showing just yet, we currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Muro Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tesla in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Ascenta, and Jim Burness, and of course, out of this world support to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and Ian. Want to be part of this amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue, and it keeps the hungry algorithm satiated. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!